So hello everybody, my name is Hanna Chuchvaga and I will be talking about memory, trauma and Anthropocene today in relation to Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Thank you very much Jillian for inviting me for giving this presentation. I'm really, really honored. So um, Chernobyl has a symbolic meaning for several generations of East Europeans. It is both the place of the catastrophic nuclear explosion and the representation of a past apocalyptic landscape, as well as an eloquent demonstration of Anthropocene. Contemporary artists uh, try to perceive Chernobyl on various levels. The mainstream of the artistic investigation, which is well known in the West, is realized mostly in photography and film. The predominant artist practice is to travel to the site and document what they see to grasp the meaning of this catastrophe, and sometimes to assume the roles of prophets of the Anthropocene in order to warn the humanity. Many of these artists envision Chernobyl within discourse in which the catastrophic and utopic premises of nuclear energy deployed the powerful visual stimulus of spitting atoms as metaphor. Others pursue documenting the images of destruction, petrified ruins, and abandonment, rare impoverished, impoverished settlers, and expound the nature of Chernobyl as counter reality create impossible alternatives of Chernobyl. However, there is another category uh, of artists who uh, aim to explore and explain Chernobyl not as observers, but as witnesses and even uh, as participants of the tragedy. For them, Chernobyl is a part of their being, their soul, their blood. Similar to the interviewees of Svetlana Alexievich, the Belarusian writer and the Nobel laureate in literature in 2015, who became the heroes of her heart heartbreaking voices from Chernobyl, Chernobyl prayer. These artists think of Chernobyl in terms of their per uh, personal emotional and physical experience uh, and its consequences. They're not the visitors to the scene uh, who come to feel and thrill from the abandoned town of Pripyat and its surroundings, but those Belarusian and Ukrainian artists for whom Chernobyl epitomizes the point of non-return, the overwhelming tragedy of their people, and the devastation of their land, for whom Chernobyl is an inverted metaphor of the legitimacy of peaceful autumn and the result, results of the Anthropocene. Uh, these artists are the uh, part of large community of those affected by Chernobyl. After the disaster, the people from the polluted territories, both uh, those who were displaced or who remained uh, in their villages and towns, or the people who after the mandatory settlement returned to their native homes, were stigmatized and attained the common name of Chernobylsi. This term identifies people affiliated with the disaster geographically and especially those who develop health issues associated with uh, Chernobyl uh, and the displaced uh, from the contaminated territory as well. So these um, people formed a certain social identity for whom the memory of Chernobyl became associated with trauma. While the rest of the world currently experiences the tendency to forget about Chernobyl and other nuclear disasters such as Fukushima or Three Mile Island, acknowledging them mostly as history, for Chernobyl, Chernobyl becomes the realm of memory. The scholars have debated on the tension between memory, trauma, and history, and offer different approaches. Pierre Nora, who was one of the first scholars to explain the difference between history and memory narrated, I quote, history belongs to everyone and to no one, and therefore has a universal vocation. Memory is rooted in the concrete, in space, gesture, image, object. History dwells exclusively on temporal communities, on changes in things in, and in the relations among things. Memory is absolute, while history is always relative. End of the quote. Many scholars, however, warn that this is a memory which may not be reliable and can be distorted or biased. 
and explain how memory is influenced by the cultural context or mental health issues or illnesses. Um, memory especially inflated with certain traumatic experience can be an episodic autobiographical phenomenon accompanied by various psychological disorders or sometimes dissociative amnesia. So indeed, any types of psychological stress or trauma often expressed through various artistic manifestations, such as autobiographical writings or poetic forms, paintings, works on paper, installations, or performances, which appear to be the attempts to physically and emotionally recuperate from the distressing experience, combat trauma, and recover as creativity and of course as our therapy shows. So one of the most powerful tools to help overcome post-traumatic distress. Indeed, in the kaleidoscope of memories related to Chernobyl catastrophe, each and every one memory is unique. But at the same time, post-Chernobyl memory is collective memory. Uh, in contrast to Nara, for whom the understanding of memory is often an exercise in nostalgia. For many Belarusians and Ukrainians, Chernobyl is an equivalent of to unfathomable trauma that goes beyond of simply being associated with the territory of the disaster and enters the existential spheres of the essence of human being. There is birth and death, natality and mortality, according to Griselda Paul, and deep concerns about the future of humanity. So as we will see, the same tropes appear and reappear within several decades after the catastrophe in order to express mutual feelings and to find the compelling uh, visual language and symbolism, which is understood by many. So this paper analyzes post-Chernobyl art of trauma created by witnesses or by Chernobyl in a wide understanding of this storm. Uh, this is the artist associated who associated themselves with the disaster on various levels and who trace the visual messages and meanings of trauma that occur in many artworks. So this paper employs Griselda Pollock's theoretical approach on trauma. According to Pollock, trauma is linked with a specifically feminine association in which the maternal feminine is the sphere of the unthinkable. The womanhood and motherhood is not only connected with birth, but also with death. The idea that, which is uh, very strongly embedded inside Freudian psychoanalysis and Lacanian theory in particular. This concept is explored through the prism of the visual symbolism of Christianity, uh, with an emphasis on the Marian cult, which uh, regained its influence after the perestroika, and as we will see, was employed by many artists. Uh, it will be shown how the images of post-Chernobyl generalized mothers refer to Theotokos with an emphasis on motherhood. Um, Theotokos means Bagamite, mother of God, right? Uh, and since through the analysis of the maternal as a manifestation of fragility and uncertainty in front of disturbing, disturbing traumatic experience. Um, naming them Madonnas, however, uh, we'll see that we will talk about Chernobyl Madonnas, um, however, alluded to art of Renaissance because it was more acceptable by the Soviet official art canon than traditional Orthodox icons. The paper also tends the dif uh, different modes in representation of trauma created by male and female artists. Uh, post Chernobyl art typically represents symbolical narratives and tell the story of the disaster in metaphorical symbols referring to repentance, redemption, and the acceptance of one's fate. Among the most exploited motives are numerous allusions to Christian iconography, images of abandoned villages against dark skies or twilight, dying nature, stranded people who lost their land and homes, deserted objects associated with country life, post-apocalyptic landscapes lived by fire or bloody dusk, mourning people with candles or wearing masks, and the generalized images of motherhood. The images of motherhood probably most stark and evocative in terms of general, uh, generating the impression of time trauma. 
emotionally are connected to early childhood, vulnerability, and the centrality of motherly protection. They intrinsically reveal the instinctive importance of the images of mothers in the artist's lives. Uh, even though the first pieces appeared within a short period of time after the disaster, only after the Soviet Union collapse uh, in 1991 was the theme of Chernobyl officially open for discussion. Uh, and the important, uh, importance of conducting public art projects appeared. Um, the monumental tapestry Chernobyl was designed by Alexander Kishenko. Uh, it involved in 1991. It still remains the most powerful and most monumental public art piece created in Belarus uh, in order to allegorically <clears throat> excuse me, exp uh, express the disaster, which, however, physically is not located in the country. An expression of gratitude from the Republic of Belarus for the United Nations resolution regarding Chernobyl nuclear accident, this tapestry now is on display in the United Nations headquarters in New York. So you can go and see it actually here. Regarding the resolution, UN resolution, there were money, uh, more than $600 million, uh, dollars, uh, which were supposed to be sent to Belarus to deal with the catastrophe, but the, this money were never sent, unfortunately. So um, because, um, because uh, there was a conclusion that there is no evidence, enough evidence of the damage. So um, this epic tapestry tell the story of the disaster in metaphoric images, reference in Renaissance art, folk art, Greek mythology, and William Blake's illustrations to Milton's Paradise Lost, Kishin unfolds his illusion-laden narrative in three parts. Uh, the center of the composition is a human worshiping a sign of atomic energy, which spurts with dragons, epitomizing the disaster. The rooster is a representation of warning, which refers to Slavic folklore. A symbol of self-assurance, the human figure resembles both the Blake and fallen angel and Greek Icarus. His wings are false and attached with the strings. Below him is St. George killing the dragon. The image that symbolizes firefighters and those who contain the disaster. The same human on the, on the left uh, is holding the book with the image of Golgotha. The right wing of the tapestry is a woman with a child. Surrounded with vegetables and fruits, she symbolizes Belarus. Iconography, iconographically, sorry, she refers to the Virgin, Raphael Sistine Madonna in particular. But she is human and her wings are also pretend. The child in her hands holds an apple, the forbidden fruit from the biblical tree of knowledge. The teenage boy with the flute is probably a reference to the future generations of Belarusians who are now affected by the disaster. The pictorial narrative of trauma is visually uh, reinforced uh, by the repetition of the same figure of the winged mother who is holding a dead or sick baby. She resembles the Totokas from Orthodox icons and supports the message of inevitable tragedy. All three scenes are enclosed in circles that float in about the um, abyss. But this abyss is not created by nature. It's a man-made chasm which is covered with perfectly rectangular grills. Birds and fish are trying to escape this technological trap in despair. Kishilka's contemporary and highly uh, acclaimed Belarusian artist Mikhail Savitsky used allusions to Mary and the child for his entire career from paintings devoted to the Second World War, he was a survivor of Nazi camps, to his latest uh, uh, last series dedicated to Chernobyl. His Madonna of Chernobyl um, is also part of the series Black Truth, Chernobyl, in association with Chernobyl. Uh, and this is the image, it's an image of death. Oster and its composition and artistic means painted in dark, almost monochromatic colors, the painting depicts a mother and her dead child 
or rests in the hands of two angels. But the window uh, and the curtain behind the group remind the viewer that the tragedy happens in real life. Savitsky alludes to the traditional Christian iconographic motive in which Theotokos is depicted sitting on the throne with the baby Jesus on her laps and surrounded by two saints or angels on her sides. In Savitsky's interpretation, the child is dead and the scene of celebration, glory is transformed into the scene of mourning becoming a pieta. Victor Barabanso, uh, Madonna of Chernobyl, uh, is also a stark contribution to the theme. His Madonna is lit by, uh, lit by glowing fire of the Chernobyl reactor, wears a white mask and holds the baby who is also in the military gas mask. Barabansov's university professor, Havrila Vashenka, belonged to the same generation, generation as Kishenka and Savitsky. Um, the village where he was born was located within the, within the exclusion zone that was delimited after the disaster. And his Chernobyl Theotokos appears on the top of the canvas titled The Requiem of Chernobyl. The child sits on Mary's lap in the traditional pose of Lawrence with outstretched hands, which means one who is praying or pleading, which refers to both prayer and the future crucifixion. Both the mother and child appear on the top of the cross, which divides the painting into four parts. The faces of people are probably the innocent victims of Chernobyl departing to the stars. And the bottom of the painting is a generalized village uh, image of the village with the dead tree in the middle, which also might refer to the death on the cross. Uh, the disposition of colors, reds, yellows, and browns create an escapable illusion of fire. The fire indeed was not associated with radioactive pollution, and all the villages remained visually undamaged by invisible radiation. But in the imagination of the generation of Belarusians who survived the Second World War, the disaster and devastation was often associated with fire. Thus, the village of fire might indeed refer to the Second World War, when many Belarusian villages, such as well-known village of Hatin, were burned by Nazis to ashes. The sculpture of Mary and child in the pose of Orans also greets the visitors of the Ukrainian National Chernobyl Museum, Museum in Kiev. Created by Leonid Verstak, this sculptural group is framed in arches and that resemble both the iconostasis and the entrance to the Orthodox Church. The bells on the sides refer to the announcement of tragedy and also a symbol of mourning. This sculpture is a sober and minimalist reminder of the Chernobyl disaster, which story is told by the museum. However, um, one of the most striking uh, Ukrainian contributions to the theme of Chernobyl trauma is an image of Theotokos depicted against the scene of nuclear explosion. This painting by Yuri Nikitin, and it openly refers to Anthropocene. Uh, Nikitin's heroine is depicted in the canonical pose of Yelusa, in which child and mother express their tenderness to each other. In this painting, her eyes are closed, while child looks with his adult gaze directly to the viewer. Their bodies are in the process of decomposition that happens in front of the beholder who can see their half-exposed skeletons. Uh, the nature around them is the image of the apocalypse, and the clock refers to Salvador Dali's persistence of memory. This clock is indeed an indication of time and memory stolen by the universal obliteration. The exposed, exposed skeletons of animals and people evoke X-ray images. They also references to invisible radiation, uh, that imperceptibly destroys flesh. Nikitin's explosion finds its mystical and surrealist continuation in Van Jupan's Chernobyl Madonna, or Apocalypse. Uh, Jupan's mother and child resemble mutated aliens or distorted by genetic degeneration, sorry, humanoids from sci-fi cinema. They are dystopian symbols of post-apocalyptic consequences 
caused by Chernobyl cataclysm that according to the artist can provoke genetic mutations in the future generations and lead to degradation of humanity. Uh, expressing post uh, Chernobyl trauma, excuse me, <clears throat> the Soviet and uh, early post-Soviet artists encountered the problem of depicting the invisible. The radiation unnoticeably and imperceptibly destroyed the human body and infects nature. Exploring the invisibility of destruction, however, uh, the absolute majority of artists did not turn to the means of abstraction, but tended to convey their ideas employing representational art canons. Uh, the strong tradition of abstract art developed in late Imperial Russia and later in the USSR by modernist trends was interrupted in the 1930s, becoming replaced by the officially prescribed ideology of socialist realism. The intermittent intellectual abstractionist practice never fully recovered, spurting only sporadically at small underground exhibits, which intermittently happened during Khrushchev, though, and continued into the Brezhnev era of stagnation. Meanwhile, in the pre-war and post-war decades in the West, artists became increasingly interested in exploring the invisible, creating art for the atomic age, and being fascinated with visual explanations of the essence of the atomic sublime and after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with its destructive power. Thus, for example, Barnett Newman, Jackson Pollock, and Margaret co-abstractions were driven by the means, by the themes associated with the atomic energy and their spiritual self-examination. Uh, their art of the first decade after the World War II is the art of a mystery and somber tragedy of life in the atomic age. As Lynn Gamble elucidates, I quote, Newman explained that the artists no longer shared ancient man's terror before unknown forces of nature because after the bomb, the artists knew the forces. He declared further that the artist would create an art expressing modern tragedy, the human condition after the bomb, the new sense of fate appropriate to the atomic age. End of the quote. So appearing in front of the similar intellectual dilemma, how to portray the invisible and incomprehensible, the Soviet and post-Soviet artists turned to associations with ancient terror instead of using the means of abstraction. Because even if they would chew the radical experimental abstractionism in the late 80s, their art would never be accepted by the officials or understood by white public who were taken from the context of abstractionist and expressionist art for the decades. Uh, the association of trauma with the maternal and motherhood was exploited long before the Chernobyl disaster. And such images of motherhood were often indirectly related to trauma of war. But in relation to Anthropocene, such an exploration of the theme was not present until, until 1985. Perhaps one of the first images in which an artist ordered the concern about the environment and the nuclear war threat, so omnipresent during the Cold War, was Evgeny Pavlov's photomontage, The Alternative, uh, which appeared one year prior to Chernobyl catastrophe. The Kharkiv, a non-conformist photographer and one of the founders of the group Time, employed the image of the mother and child with an allusion to Theotokos uh, as an eloquent expression of human choice. The mother in the pose of Orans holds her child on her lap, appearing in the center of the photomontage. Uh, divided by an invisible line, they represent two possible alternatives. The left half of the image is post-apocalyptic landscape with fragmented faces of people and ancient Greek and Roman sculptures that epitomize the ruinous consequences of the nuclear war. Clashed together in apocalyptic agony, they form the tree of knowledge, which is dissolving into pieces in polluted atmosphere. The mother is wearing a military mask and holding the child with her disembodied hand 
while the body of the baby seems to be decaying. On the right, the same mother uh, and child personify another choice, life in normal world and healthy environment. Their bodies are not distorted or damaged. The human holds a sphere with two small figures that possibly serve as an allusion to Adam and Eve and express the message of procreation. The photograph was awarded silver medal at the Poznan International Salon of Art Photographers that took place in Poland and exhibit was exhibited in Kharkiv, Moscow and abroad. In 1981, the alternative appeared on the cover of Soviet Photo, the magazine of the Union of the Journalists of the USSR, the major specialist photography periodical published in the Soviet Union. Pavlov's visual metaphor that paralleled the image of mother and child with an environmental disaster appeared quite timely. On the one hand, it loudly reverberated with Mikhail Gorbachev's ambition to end the nuclear arms race. On the other hand, during Perestroika, the message that woman's main work is the work of motherhood gained new power and became a political agenda. After the Soviet Union collapse, this message was adopted by the newly established independent countries, including Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. Like post Chernobyl artworks, Pavlov's photomontage employed evangelical symbolism combined with the obvious trope of Mother Earth, often present in Slavic folklore and mythology. In the folkloric imagination, Mother Earth was parallel to the image of Mary, the divine mother and the biblical metaphor of sacrifice. The exploration of evangelical symbolism and the use of Christian metaphors in art significantly reinforced uh, uh, during and after uh, the perestroika being underpinned by the growth of spirituality and massive social turn to the church, which was not persecuted anymore and now was associated with cultural customs and traditions that have to be restored and passed to the new generations. By the 90s, the increasing influence of orthodoxy and the general rise of religiousness in post-Soviet countries was largely formed by the dominance of the Moscow Patriarchy in Belarus and Ukraine. The collapse of the USSR and economic crisis only strengthened the church influence, which now was becoming the new ideological outpost for many. In this context of bottomless crisis and post-Chernobyl doom and despair, the cult of Mary was galvanized by the collective memory, and her images were interpreted in this new social cultural environment became a part of the new visual language entitled to express anxieties, traumas, and uncertainty. And on the other hand, to disrupt with Soviet aesthetic and, and artistic canons. Not all of the post Chernobyl art of trauma alludes to Teotokas or to the Madonnas evoking um, religious symbolism. Many of the works refer to motherhood or offer a metaphor of suffering without turning to evangelical themes. Thus, Taras Palataika's conceptual installation, Cradle, uh, is also created to convey the Chernobyl trauma. Palataika doesn't belong to the community of Chernobylsi, but the maternal is indirectly present in his work. Uh, it, it is, uh, however, uh, not a, it, it is, however, of a completely different mode, means, means of representation and artistic concept, but in decidedly uh, provocative way. After completing uh, his uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from one of the major Soviet art schools, uh, the Strogan of Moscow State Academy, Academy of Arts, Polotaika emigrated to Canada. Uh, and Ukrainian Canadian artist completely dissociated himself from Chernobyl, uh, sorry, from the Soviet and post Soviet tradition of representational canon, becoming an abstract and conceptual artist. His installation, Cradle, is one of the strongest expressions of invisible radiation and physical and emotional trauma. Palataika traveled to Chernobyl in 1994 and visited the zone of exclusion. Exposed to radiation there, after his return to Canada, he began drawing his blood regularly in the uh, in a repository, which is which he preserved in the freezer. 
Cradle was performed in 95 and represented a nickel plated bus top suspended from the gallery ceiling by heavy industrial chains, resembling a cradle found in traditional Ukrainian houses. And the top contained a hermet hermetically sealed five liter sample of artist's blood, uh, which approximates the amount of blood in the human cardiovascular system. The bus top full of blood can also be seen uh, as the image of death, obviously. Uh, Plataika, however, explains, I quote, Cradle reflects my interest in the process of mutation and the parallels that may be drawn between biological transformation and changes in the realms of politics or culture. In the case of Chernobyl, uncontrolled radiation impact, impacted on the human genetic code, but it also served as a catalyst for the Soviet Union's collapse. End of the quote. In Palateka's provocative installation, blood is a substance uh, that symbolizes both the artist's body and spirit. Blood as substance from the body represents the physical trauma of being exposed to ha hazardous radiation, while blood is a spiritual essence of a human, denotes his spiritual attachment to the land of his ancestors. And the bus stop that functions to the cradle refers to that as well. The message of the motherhood is delivered indirectly and almost to the level of the, uh, of the subconscious, but it's still present here. Uh, the symbolic mother and child abandon their home, the contaminated area, and their homeland, and they never come in back. Uh, <clears throat> as it was already mentioned, death and trauma were expressed through the images of motherhood by many artists, uh, writers, filmmakers, uh, long before a Chernobyl disaster. In her powerful lecture delivered to the three-day colloquium mapping the maternal art, ethics, and anthropocene, which took place in Edmonton in 2016, the keynote speaker and feminist thinker and art historian Griselda Pollock, referring to the famous novel Life and Fate, um, by Jewish-Ukrainian Soviet writer Vasily Grossman eloquently established the connections between expressions of Holocaust-related trauma and the images of the virgin, images of the motherhood and early childhood. She also emphasized the connection between the Anthropocene and the maternal, linking it to the mortality and natality. The colloquium's main agenda was to attempt to use maternal ethics as it was defined by philosopher Sarah Riddick as non-violent anti-militaristic approach based on a daily do job of nurturing children and by psychoanalysis Bracha Ettinger as an early language based on the threats of present societal and ecological imbalance of the world today. So Pollock suggests that in Therizin Trauma, Ettinger, uh, quote, inflects Freud's phantasmatic, pre-symbolic dark continent with a specifically feminine association, exposing the effect in Lacanian theory of placing the maternal feminine in the sphere of the unthinkable, unknowable, unknowable, unrepresentable, real. End of the quote. Ettinger also links women not only to with birth, but also with death, explaining that, I quote, the idea of death is closely, is very closely connected to the feminine in the Western culture. And it's very strongly embedded inside Freudian psychoanalysis in general, in uh, Lacanian theory uh, in particular. End of the quote. Um, as we already determined here, the examined artworks that express Chernobyl trauma and the death and death are often connected to the maternal, expressing subconscious fears and the significance of the maternal and prenatal protection and the idea that each human comes to this world to eventually die. Bringing her child to the world full of sorrows becomes the mother's sole responsibility not speaking of a traumatic and indeed subconscious experience of being born and leaving the maternal womb in order to only temporarily visit this world. Thus, the allusions to the motherhood are the most powerful tool in the expression of traumatic experience, and they work as a universal aesthetic trope 
that is always comprehended by the beholder because, as Pollock explains further, I quote, the unremembered traumatic dimension of the matrix is not about fusion loss, but about shareability and co-emergence, end of the quote. Uh, Pollock also defines how the concept of beauty differs from the maternal, from the maternal, I quote, the paradox of the phallic and aesthetic opposition it creates between beauty, the clearly distinguished object and the defensive shield against that limit and the feminine. Hence the most beautiful thing in the beautified, uh, idealized non-maternal, non-death bearing female body and the sublime. A frightening proximity still managed through the overwhelming. It mutated into the feminine. End of the quote. Yes, Kalev, which is very, very kind of heavy. Um, and it was shown uh, that trauma and an escapable doom linked to the maternal were powerful means of representation and were employed by the male artists. They indeed generalized the motherhood and portrayed Madonnas with babies delivering messages of unknown futures, often placing their responsibility on the mother. The paternal messages are rarely associated with Chernobyl trauma. Male personages are mostly associated with liquid, uh, liquidators of the catastrophe and shown as heroes. Women artists, however, express their Chernobyl traumas to not just men. They also employed images associated uh, um, with motherhood and the maternal. However, their vision of trauma was different from male artists. If uh, male artists portrayed a universal symbol of motherhood, women often personalized their traumatic experiences linked to Chernobyl. Thus, one of the first of the Chernobyl paintings in Ukraine um, was Larisa Mishenko's uh, I Want to Leave. It was painted very short, shortly after the disaster. Um, in, in this painting, the artist portrays her young daughter, Christina. She's a symbol of all children, especially girls and the future mothers who become, became the hostages of the ecological disaster nobody ever expected. The bare, barefoot teenage girl in her puberty stands on the dry cracked soil, which symbolizes infertility. In her hands, she holds two bird feeders and one of them is full of grains and the other one is empty. The girl with bird feeders reminds uh, one of Themis, the Greek goddess of justice and the divine order. And if asking what the choice will be for this new generation, will they have their lives, uh, uh, will have in their lives procreation or infertility? Birds are flying around the girl and the beholder uh, sees broken birds' eggs on the bottom of the canvas. These broken eggs are symbols of children who will never be born. An uh, even more eloquent representation of personal and non-generalized trauma is found in paintings from the series The Zone by Christina Katrakis. While a child, Katrakis was in a zone of exclusion in a village some 15 miles away from Chernobyl disaster. She explains her experience. I quote, uh, we were evacuated a week later. But by then I was severely radiated and then developed a tumor in my throat. I spent nearly two years recovering from the surgery, but the radiation affected my body forever. Yet I never considered myself as a victim, just a happy survivor." End of the quote. The most poignant images from the series also touch the theme of the maternal. Katrakis' first child was born premature and died several days after his birth, an experience that traumatized her to her core. After the premature birth and death, uh, of her son, did the specter of Chernobyl pneumonia glimpses begin to preoccupy the, preoccupy the artist. Her second baby was lost for the same reason. Thus the most horrifying image from the series is the omen. Here the artist explains, I quote, the beast tears out of the golden child looked uh, out of my womb. Yet the child sprinkles me with the gold dust of love and life. While these works seem monochromatic, specific primary colors are associated with my memory. Red, 
blood with surgery, black, wild with old photographs, yellow with radiation and brown blue with iodine and Prussian blue given to drink to absorb heavy metals, end of the quote. The canvas combines two painting molds. The surrealist and completely flat beast uh, is schematic, symbolic, an imaginary creature which contrasts to the realistically depicted with care careful care score of woman in the red dress, which symbol of blood, who lies on a bed of gray rock. The dreaming woman seems calm and undisturbed by the golden baby with umbilical cord which stretches from her eviscerated womb appears directly in the center of the composition and creates a message of a personal and not generalized tragedy. Another Katrakis work, Kaver, the map of Eastern promises, also refers to women and their infertilities caused by Chernobyl and reverberates with mission because I want to leave. It portrays the body of a nude woman shaped as a silk kiev at the water reservoir, which was damaged by Chernobyl catastrophe. As Katrakis describes, I quote, the area around uh, it is a map of the zone uh, with Soviet collage of cover factory workers. Yet cover produced by them is in the shape of embryos since the explosion damaged female reproduction function and brought upon born effects in babies. End of quote. The nude female body is perfectly beautiful and resembles sleeping Venus with allusion to Velasquez rock Venus, um, a non-maternal image of ideal femininity, according to Pollock's explanation. But this non-child bearing flawless body clashes with actual meaning of this painting in which the sleeping woman is a representation of her damaged reproduction function, which she is not aware of. So expressing traumas and traumatic memories associated with certain place and experience is never an easy task. Producing a meaningful conversation by the use of visual means is even a harder mission. Trauma is like the beast from Katrakis painting, it's invisible, schematic, and often incomprehensible, and sometimes can be expressed only with the use of archaic symbols and ideas in order to produce the metaphor of suffering and death or to evoke a personal memory. So um, um, now I want to share some like, um, like recent experience, my reflection on war and um, uh, my personal memory. So as someone who was affected by the Chernobyl disaster personally and expressed the experience, the associated trauma, I always knew that it will stay for, with me forever. But also I'm a historian and um, it was essential for me to investigate post-Chernobyl art and it mean, uh, meaning because the recurring metaphors of motherhood, they called call for explanation. And I approach to the images of Chernobyl trauma from the position of cultural historian who, who um, explores and explains the past. Um, at the time, I could not imagine that th this trope would reappear as an image of trauma again. And this time in the context of brutality of the war happening in the land of my maternal ancestors. Uh, when the Russian Federation invaded Ukraine on February, 24th of February um, this year. So the first shelling and bombing attacks of peaceful Ukrainian cities by Ukrainian Federation obviously shocked the world. And um, the trauma of the first day of the Russian invasion to Ukraine was documented through the images of the maternal, these shocked me from the very beginning. So the photograph of a woman breastfeeding her newborn baby in Kiev subway was taken by the journalist on 25th of February. And it became one of the first poignant images of trauma conveyed through the maternal. It later um, inspired the creation of the painting and then the icon inspired uh, the uh, icon was created and was inspired by the work um, by 
the artist Maria, Marina Salamenikova. This icon right now is called Kiev Madonna and located in Naples in Italy. So the whole world saw these heartbreaking photographs of um, uh, women with babies and especially uh, women with babies in underground shelters and pregnant women evacuated from Mariupol maternity hospital sheltered by Russians. So another woman who saved her baby girl was by shielding her from shell and was called the Ukrainian Madonna by international media, was shared by millions of users on social networks. Uh, and these um, expressive images of trauma resonated with numerous viewers. Also a very new, a completely different trope appeared um, in association with war. Uh, so women warriors, as both uh, personification of Ukraine and motherhood, motherhood um, that happened uh, when uh, many women joined the fight as soldiers. Thus, this image of a male warrior appeared in official video of Kalush Orchestra, who performed the song Stefania, which won the Eurovision Song Contest of 2022, you can Google it and um, see the video. It featured uh, silent portraits of women dressed in military uniforms and holding children. These women warriors, uh, warriors shield children lost amid uh, overpower and destruction. They also personify mothers who have left their families to fight against Russian aggression, a message that again resonated with millions of viewers, viewers around the globe. Um, the images of mothers with children of all collective cultural memories um, and archetypes often associated with mo mo motherly protection. Uh, these portrayals express the idea of protection rather than fighting, uh, which is read by the viewers as a conscious protection from trauma and as emotional reconciliation. Mothers do fight for their children, but they also nurture, heal, and protect. And one of the most shared images on social networks was uh, Dana Witkowska's New Orans of Kiev, which openly quoted the 11th century mosaic Orans of Kiev, the mosaic from St. Uh, Sophia uh, Cathedral uh, in Kiev, um, but she also included the mod image of mother and the baby but um, openly quoting the Orans uh, of Kiev, who is the official protector, protectress of Kiev, city of Kiev. So indeed, uh, we all are living in the age of trauma, uh, in which ecological crisis and natural disasters, Me Too movement, mass migrations, refugee crisis, post-colonialism and wars create new collective traumatic experiences. Visual arts uh, art tells the stories of traumas in symbolic terms and images. Excavated from the subconscious, the pictorial language of trauma is suffused with cultural archetypes. Therefore, the visual expressions of trauma have to be powerful and understandable by many. The recurrent images of motherhood in different interpretations and then on different levels signify the prominence of motherly protection and vulnerability, sorrow and sacrifice temporality of being and fragility of life. So it was shown that in case of Chernobyl, this universal trope, the universal trope of suffering returns as most elegant manifestation of trauma again. And as we see, it appears again. So thank you very much. I, I hope I was not, it wasn't, it didn't take too long. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much. Uh, this was wonderful and very powerful. So I already see um, Ryan Pox hand up and I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself, Ryan, and ask your question. Um, okay, so um, my question is Chernobyl is often like referred to as like the Red Forest. And so I was wondering if that had any connection or depiction from like different paintings, like I already saw like Taras Polatico's uh, cradle, there was the idea of blood and death. I was wondering if there was a symbolic meaning between that and like the red forest, um, which is often referred to as the Chernobyl site. 
uh, which exactly uh, examples would 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 you would you mean um, the relation red forest and Chernobyl and which one could you say uh, could you repeat again say again I think Ryan were you just suggesting that you have heard of the Chernobyl zone as it, referenced as yeah. the red forest in general yeah, that's yeah. Just something that you've heard and you're no, uh, it, the, the forest, there was no fire there. It was just purely imaginary because it was fire is associated with danger, with um, burning villages, uh, with a destruction. So um, visually, visually, there were no fires. So people didn't see fires. It's only imaginary. Probably it was associated with the uh, Second World War in people's imagination more than with the Chernobyl itself, because this was like, again, archetypal kind of construct of danger and destruction. Thank you. Um, I, ha I see several questions in the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and read a couple of those. Um, we have one question from Calvin, which is, would you say the HBO series Chernobyl is more representative of the visitor perspective or the witness perspective that you discussed? I would say that it's an attempt to reconstruct the history rather than memory. Even though it's based, so to speak, on Alexievich's um, Voices from Chernobyl, but the way how they produce it, it's more a construction of history than memory. This is what, how I would put it. It's not like a visitor's perspectives. No, it's a typical historical uh, reconstruction, I would say. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to keep going with a few questions in the chat here. Um, we have a question from Paige, who mentions that in one of the pieces that we read from Chernobyl Prayer, uh, the quote, their wombs were slipping out because of the hard labor. There were no men. They were all being wiped out at the front or in the partisan fighting, end quote, really stuck out to me. And that was a quote that was about the uh, the World War II era. Um, you mentioned that womanhood was defined by fertility, but this is referencing complications with the reproductive system before the disaster occurred. I was wondering, was this idea of motherhood already being challenged and was the fear of the fallout from the disaster causing infertility and complications of birth one of the reasons this trauma was felt by so many women during that time? So that's a long, a long question. A yes. long question, but whatever you, whatever you could pick out there. I think the essence of the question is really has to do with what changed with the status of womanhood and fertility um, and its association with trauma after the disaster as opposed to before. Um, no, I, I think it's always a personal tragedy. Uh, it's not... A especially women, personal tragedy of, because some women suffered from infertility, other didn't. There were definitely lots of issues with that, but I don't have a statistics, so I don't know what was happening, but there was definitely problems with that in the like first years for sure, and especially um, um, really in relation to women who lived closely, who lived closely, who were um, displaced from the territory, of course, definitely their bodies were severely radiated. Yes, it was, but I don't have a statistics. It was very hard. Actually, there is um, uh, there are studies who are trying, there are, who are trying uh, to bring the statistics and explain it. Uh, the sociology, sociological studies, and um. I think um, they might have uh, better answers to that um, because after the disaster, Soviet Union, you, we, can, we can imagine there is everything, everything is censored. People didn't know that there is a catastrophe. There, nobody knew that, right? So people uh, were informed only, it was well in May already when people were informed that this happened. 
but the cloud with the radiation was already it was already there the radiation there was a radiative rains in Guamil area in Belarus and everywhere else so the statistic uh, of the disaster how it impacted lives of people it was censored it was not actually properly recorded at this time and it caused lots of issues of course in the future it's and it's now and apparently uh, one of the scholars uh, who was studying the children who studied children uh, and uh, their uh, issues with thyroid thyroid issues um, he was um, he was jailed by Lukashenko's regime oh yes so it's a uh, it's very good question but the statistics doesn't exist it's only we can also only guess or maybe kind of gauge <laughs> what was happening. Thank you. Um, we have one question that may be um, of a different focus than you tend to speak to, but one person is wondering. Uh, Mia is wondering if you could speak at all to what specific radioactive elements were emitted to the into the environment in the Chernobyl? I think um, I think the entire uh, Middle East table was there. Uh, and it's uh, the question about how fast, how what is the period of the composition of these elements? So there was strontium and there were many others. I'm not a chemist. I cannot give you an exhaustive answer to this question, but I think there's a lots of lots of studies on that, what you can find in the soil. And even now, uh, when the war started and Chernobyl was occupied by the Russian troops, uh, they started digging something there around Chernobyl. What happened to these people, to these soldiers, they were radiated. They were radiated uh, by the radiation. So they, as far as I know, they left. They left the site because of that. So nobody knows what is happening there. And uh, I hope there is a catafal, um, uh, there was um, the build, they built the shield again uh, around it but how much she protects the area i don't know i'm not a chemist thank Especially you thank you um we have one more question here uh from tyler uh, who writes art created in response to chernobyl is obviously very grim did this sudden shift in artistic output cause a noticeable change in ukrainian art after this period Furthermore, were the heavy use of Christian symbolism always a was the heavy use of Christian symbolism always a component of Ukrainian art, or did Chernobyl influence these evangelical symbols? So I think really the the essence of the question here seems to be to what extent um, the art of Chernobyl continued um, previous traditions, and to what extent it created a new tradition in Ukrainian art. I won't say that it's a really new tradition was created. Uh, this tradition, like uh, um, uh, these Madonnas uh, who represented traumas, uh, they were known since Petrov Vodkins, um, uh, Pet Petrograd of uh, 1918, when you see the, the woman who looks like Theotokos and who is holding the baby, and it's devoted to civil war, civil war. Um, this was the first, at least what I know, image of suffering and which employed this symbolism. So uh, that was also repeated by the artists of uh, Soviet Union who survived the Second World War and they were called this, uh, this, the style they worked in was called severe style, surovi stil. And they employed evangelical symbolism too. Uh, and that was acceptable because this is, this is how they overcame their traumas. And in particular, Savitsky, uh, who was, uh, who was uh, acknowledged artist in Belarus, 
Uh, he explored, um, employed the images of the maternal and images of Madonnas in relation to war, like in the 70s, painted in the 60s and the 70s. So it was in the Soviet Union and Bre Brezhnev's time. So it wasn't he wasn't persecuted for that. He was actually really praised for that. So um, it wasn't like a new, completely new trend. It was a new interpretation of the theme. So, and it was safe to express that because it was already present in, uh, in art and it was already accepted by the um, officials, so to speak. So it was okay to, but they called them Madonnas uh, in reference to Renaissance, because it was more acceptable, was easier to deal with than Bogomasters and Theotokas, because obviously orthodoxy was more persecuted than kind of general idea of beauty um, expressed by Renaissance art. Renaissance art wasn't prohibited, definitely, this. Yeah, so it was a uh, artistic canon for many artists, so that is why they kind of tried to express through these ideas. Yeah, it wasn't new. And um, I would say, uh, so they're different, very different, of course, expressions. I would say that the majority, lots of lots of images associated with Chernobyl is just um, villages, abandoned villages, mourning people, something like that, not just mothers. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question in the chat from Caroline. She's wondering if you could clarify um, why exactly death is associated with femininity in many of the paintings that you're discussing. Uh, this is uh, the idea expressed by Griselda Pollock, the feminist, the British feminist art historian uh, and thinker. Uh, and uh, other feminist uh, writers, uh, they link particularly death and a birth of a child because we come to this world. So this is subconscious idea. The human being comes to the, this world, leaves the womb. And this is already the trauma, subconscious trauma. And somehow subconsciously, it is related, so the mothers with babies, because it's a recurrent symbol. It comes out and comes out. It's not that maybe you see it differently, but many people read it as an image of trauma. So it's subconscious. Thank you. Um, and let me see if we have, uh, now I see that Ryan, your hand is still up. Is that just left over from before or do you have another comment? Just left over, okay. Um, well, I have one question um, that I'd be glad to ask. You mentioned Svetlana Alexeyevich's Chernobyl prayer, um, and we're reading that in the course that is visiting this lecture today. Um, and you were talking about um, the art of witnesses, right? And Alexeyevich's book could be understood as an example of that. And one of the um, one of the points that she makes in Chernobyl prayer is when she's speaking in her own voice is that um, the Chernobyl disaster was the beginning of a new history. Um, and she speaks about it as a catastrophe of time. So this idea that it's a fundamental rupture or break with all that had gone before. And I was thinking about that as I was looking at the images that you showed and um, you specifically show how when confronted with the Chernobyl disaster and with the task of trying to make sense of the mystery and the invisibility of nuclear threat, um, the artists that you're, the, wit the artist witnesses that you're studying reverted to ancient symbolism, um, Christian and in some cases folk symbolism. And I'm just wondering what you think about this use of ancient symbolism in relation to the idea of Chernobyl as the beginning of a new 
history. Um, doesn't the incorporation of ancient symbolism imply a certain historical continuity or, or not? In your view, does the art that you're studying represent the Chernobyl disaster as a fundamental rupture or the beginning of something new, a new period, or is the emphasis on a kind of a continuity in cultural traditions or in uh, in the value of ancient symbolism to understand this latest phase of history? It's everything, <laughs> it's, it's everything, of course. So what we see in the many artists and Paula Taika, for example, said that we, uh, Chernobyl disaster, it's not just uh, the catastrophe, it's also end of um, symbolic end of the Soviet Union for many artists. So, and probably for Alexievich as well. So it's not, uh, that is why it's probably she's speaking there. It's a new era starts. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the church is uh, not prosecuted anymore, right? So people can express themselves. So the, there is a catastrophe. There is a whole mood of doom, the despair in the society. And they, in perestroika and after, they turn to church to find the answers they were not, in, were not able to find before. So they, church, they turn to these images. They pray, obviously. So that is why we Chernobyl prayer, they pray. Right. So and this is the only way how they find probably how to express themselves. Uh, uh, so on the um, on one hand, this is a continuity. They turn to the past. They uh, want to bring culture and the images which are pre-Soviet which are understood by many, but also they want to transfer these cultural values and images to the next generations, because it's very important to create this link be between what was before the Soviet Union and after. So this is kind of, I see it like as a connection uh, with the pre-Soviet, like cultural memory. So it's how the cultural memory works in this case. This is how I see it at least. So it's, this is both, it's everything you, you mentioned. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, oh, I have, I see a hand from Katarina Mazur. If you wanna go ahead and unmute, you're welcome to ask. Hello, um, I'm calling in from Wesleyan University in Connecticut. Um, thanks so much for having this amazing talk and for bringing your personal experience into your work and everything that's really important and beautiful. Um, I am writing about uh, po a post-Soviet ritual a little bit, but also uh, Karen Barad's uh, understanding of like space time mattering in a post-atomic world. So I'm working with like, uh, time like past present and future sort of being folded all in together in a in a post nuclear situation um, and i'm looking at chernobyl from that point of view um, and i'm also exploring this icon of the dedushka in uh like ukrainian folk stuff and i was wondering if you had any examples of the uh iconography or anything related to chernobyl or is the woman's body and and uh, the Madonna icon pretty central to Babushka or Dedushka. Dedushka. <laughs> yeah. uh, the grandfather. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. this trope uh, is actually present because uh, as a symbol of ancestors, and in Belarus and Ukraine and both there is. Um, several days um like uh, through the year there is a days of commemoration and they are called didi 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 in ukrainian zadi in belarusian so and they usually refer to didi um as ancestors and in this particular days of commemoration uh ancestors uh, according to the beliefs folkloric beliefs um they come to see how we their um descendants live in this world right 
So yes, there is an image. There are paintings that paintings and works that present this Zadi or Didi image, uh, and who are looking with um, so deep sorrow. So, so they don't like. Of course, they don't accept what's happening. Yes, this trope is present, but it's not the same. It's not on the same kind of. It's, um, but it's, it is, yeah, I know what, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's okay, present. thank you. Do we have any other questions? This is your opportunity. If not, I mean, it doesn't seem like we do, then I think it's time we can go ahead and thank our speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Chuchvaka, for joining us and for sharing your work. This was wonderful. Thank you very much for having me, for inviting me. And it was a great pleasure and honor for me. So uh, I hope <laughs> it was it, it was a lot. It was a sorry about that. So it was a lot of information, lots of images. But I hope I was able to connect everything. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. And anyone still on the call, I'll just mention that the next uh, lecture in this Ukrainian Energy Studies lecture series will be taking place a week from today. And you can just visit the Jordan Center website for details. We'll be hearing from Per Hoagselius. Um, so thank you again, and everyone have a good day.